All right, Lisa. Greetings from Foreign Car Specialists in Poughkeepsie, New York. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, we got people uh, from pretty much all over the country joining us today. Chris, where are you nice. now? I write this five minutes. I'm sitting in Benson, Arizona. There you go. And then I see a couple of our clients on here. I see Mr. Mike Leaches, who is out in the opposite side of the country of us, out in California. Uh, see a couple of other, my other clients here that are local in Maryland and spread through across the United States. So yeah, um, we're going to get started on this. And so first and foremost, I just wanted to say thank you to not only Chris for joining me, but all of um, you know our clients, prospective clients we have on here with us today. Um, really the purpose of why I did this webinar is, you know, a number of you guys I've seen as familiar faces that have done some of our webinars in the past. Um, but one of the big things is, you know, I struggle with is getting webinars out to you guys on something that you guys want to hear us talk about or hear us go over. Um, and so in the past, we've done stuff with taxes. We've done stuff with QuickBooks Online and QuickBooks Desktop. Um, and Profit First is something that has come up along the way. Um, I would say probably within the last year or two, it's kind of rose to um, prevalency in the industry. And so I have a number of current clients right now that use Profit First. Um, I have some of them that use it very well. I have some of them that kind of use it in the infancy. I have also a number of clients that have reached out to me and said, hey, Hunt, thinking about doing Profit First, um, where do I start? Um, and like Chris and I have spoken before about this, I know enough about Profit First to be dangerous, right? I, I, I get the idea behind it. I get the basics on it. Um, the idea of Profit First is something that, you know, we kind of have talked about in the past with our clients on a very small scale. Um, you know, the first and foremost is the sales tax. It's something that we preach, making sure that that sales tax account is set up, making sure that that money is coming out of the operating account. Um, and then Profit First, as Chris is going to get into, just dives in even deeper to that of just kind of, what would you call it, Chris, kind of a physical representation of cash flow, right? It's just, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's a way to it's it's a way to keep track and measure your cash flow. Again, I'm going to, I'll get into it, but it's more about having a process and procedure about how you handle cash in your business. Um, a lot of shops that are well established they have a procedure for just about everything but maybe they don't have a, a procedure for cash flow and how they handle the money and and things like that yeah and, and really i get two complaints from my clients all across the country you know we operate with shops in about 48 different states now and so you know it, it, we kind of get a pretty good snapshot of what's going on in the industry and the two biggest complaints i hear from everyone is it's hard to find good workers. It's hard to find good help, good technicians or good service advisors. And the number two one is cash flow, right? We know how this industry is. You could have a blowout month and do the best month that you've ever had, but then the next month, maybe you have the slowest, slowest month ever. And a lot of times there's no rhyme or reason to that. And what really ends up getting crunched is the cash flow. You have a really good month, which means the next month is gonna be filed with a lot of uh, vendor bills. And then if you don't have a good month to follow it up, sometimes the cash just isn't there. And the thing I like about Profit First is it's a really good visual representation of the money that you have. Because I know how it is, not only in business, but personally, you look at your bank account and you see how much money is in there. And if you see that you have $20,000 in there, in your mindset, I'm, I would probably say to myself, hey, I can go out and spend that things that I was kind of unsure about. I got the money there. But if we're not factoring in, hey, a lot of this stuff is already earmarked for vendors. A lot of this stuff is already earmarked for the state or loan payments. Once you start factoring that in there, it's like, maybe I don't have 20000 anymore <laughs> that I can really spend. I have more like two. Um, and I think that the profit first method could kind of, you know, shed a lot of light on that. Um, so what I'm going to do is kind of step aside, Chris, and let you kind of uh, run the show here. Um, anything that you want input on or, or if I have questions to chime in, I will. Um, all of you out there um, joining us today, if you have any questions that you want to kind of go over or you want to kind of follow up on, I'm going to be keeping an eye on the chat and the question answer side. So if you want us to repeat something, um, explain a little bit more in depth, just hop into the chat or the question. We'd be happy to go into that. All right, Chris, you can take it away from here. Okay, thanks, Hunt. Um, first, I want to thank you for having me. I um, also want to thank everybody else for taking time out of the day. I know as shop owners and everything else like that, we're all busy and have things to do. But hopefully, hopefully this puts you in a good spot, in a good position moving forward. Um, also, what I'm going to tell you is if you've read the book, 
it's not going to go a lot of the concepts go exactly in line with the book but what i've done is with my 25 plus years of experience in the auto repair business and industry i've taken what i know about auto repair side of it and what i know from learning the book and going through the certification process um and have melted those two together and have really fine-tuned it for the the repair side of it the book's pretty general and tries to work for all businesses Again, ask lots of questions. Um, normally I teach this class for World Pack. It's an eight hour class and has over 60 slides. And so I've really, really tried to condense it down into something that we can do in an hour or less. Um, I, I wanna be mindful of your time again. I do appreciate you guys being here. So I'm just gonna hop right in. Again, uh, get with Hunt if you need anything and then he'll relay it to me as I go through. So the, you know, the first thing, why profit first? Uh, Profit first is, it's not a new concept. It's been around forever, but when I bought my shop, um, I had a lot of bad habits and one of them was the way I handled money or my lack of handling money. Uh, I don't know how many of you people out there, what happened is, is the wife's like, okay, we have these 32 invoices that need to be paid. Um, which one should I pay? And so I look at the bank account, kind of like what Hunt was talking about earlier and I'd go through the stack and be like okay I think we can pick this one in I can I think we can pick this one in and maybe we can fit that one and be like oops I've spent all of our money the rest of them just go back in the pot and um, trying to run your business way it was just it's just terrible to try to do it that way um, or I think it is and and knowing what I know now uh, I much prefer this method okay one of the one of the things as shop owners that I see and I fell into the same trap is the more sales you make, the more revenue you increase, the more profit you'll have. And I'll tell you right now, if you don't make any money as a quarter of a million dollar shop and have fixed those issues, chances are when you're half a million, three quarters of a million or two million dollar shop, it's not going to get any better. So there's no no time like the present to go out and fix the business and get on a right foothold and again put these policies and procedures in place. So a couple of several different things happened with me. Um, if you read the book or have read the book, he talks about his Valentine's Day uh, issue with his daughter. I had a similar Valentine's Day issue where we showed a profit in our business went to the accountant to figure out how much I owed or whatever. And he's like, okay, so you owe the IRS $26,000. And I'm like, I don't have $26,000. I mean, I know, I know I show a paper profit, but I don't actually physically have this money in the bank. And this is on a, a million and a half to $2 million a year business. So fast forward to about a year ago, uh, I read Profit First and it really resonated with me in some of the struggles that I had as a shop owner, some of the struggles that um, I continue to have as I coach other shops and things like that. And then I'm like, this is so simple. I don't know why I didn't think of this earlier. Um, also, I'm a big Dave Ramsey fan. So when I had my shop, I was doing Dave Ramsey, but it just never clicked business wise for me. So if you're a Dave Ramsey fan and, and a fan of like financial things like that, the this should resonate with you it'll it'll give you more control of your business and that's really you know we want to run our business we don't want to have our business running us okay um, this next slide most shop owners have a hobby living paycheck to paycheck and 83 percent of small businesses are in survival mode I, re, I did a lot of research and found this and and I'm like, well, that might be true, but that's not true for repair shop owners. And so I went through and looked through all my records of every new client that had come to me. And what I do is I do a discovery phase. And one of the things I ask is how many paychecks do you have to yourself that are in the top drawer of your desk right now that you haven't cash? And, and so I went through, looked at that. And honestly, that was about right. I found that 75 to 80% of auto repair shops, when they come to me, they're struggling in survival mode. They're just living paycheck to paycheck. Um, I'm not going to say that's the case for all of you people out there, but this is going to resonate with some people. Okay. Yeah. And I think this is one thing that we see a lot too. And, and even just for 
people's quality of life really is when I talk to clients and they have $5,000 in their account, even if they're extremely profitable, um, it's a stressful business to be in. They might not be having fun doing it. Um, I have a couple of shops that we've been working with for a while. When I first started working with them, I know I have a shop that was had about a million dollar a year sales shop. He was the lowest paid employee there because he was on payroll, but he kept on having to put it back into the business just to keep it afloat. And whenever I talked to him, it was always kind of doom and gloom. This industry is going down. I just can't seem to make this right. But really all the issues seem to stem from the cash. He just didn't have the cash there. Um, and a year or two later, now he's got money in the bank. He's able to take some time away on vacation. And when I talk to him, he's just so much more upbeat and positive about it. And so really it shows you is, is having that money set aside and that cash management is really the key to, um, you know, the health of your business and health of your own sanity, really. Yeah, one of the things, and this has been kind of like the last two, three months I've seen where a lot of owners, um, especially new owners getting started, are doing a lot of commingling of funds. And by commingling, I mean they're like running all their personal expenses through the shop and they can't figure out where the money's going. And then I ask them, send me an income statement. And they're like, what's that? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I can't stress the importance of an income statement and watching where your cash goes. And this is also going to help with that as well. So again, what this is, is this is a cash flow management process. This is a way to move your money through the business. And we're going to, we're going to, I have a chart here in a little bit. I'm going to show you, and it's going to take us from the minute we cash out an invoice through the week, the month, the quarter, and then through the end of the year. Okay, so I really want you guys to think about this as a cash flow management process and, and what it'll do for, for you and your business moving forward. So here's the other thing is this process, it's not going to show you how to make a profit, but it's going to show you when you set it up, which categories you're overspending or underspending. And then from that, it's going to, it's going to give us some ideas on what we need to do to shift, shift things to the right spot. Um, if we're short or different on labor, maybe we need to look at our labor rates. Maybe we need, need to look at productivity. Uh, maybe we need to look at our effective labor rate, you know, things like that. If our parts account is always short, um, either we have like a waste issue, cores aren't getting returned, um, or our margin's not high enough. So there could be several different things that affect this. Um, so after you get this set up, you want to watch and look at this and see, okay, where am I over? Where am I under? And then how do we shift and move forward? So I may get in trouble with Hunt on this one. So the old, <laughs> the old way of thinking is the, the old generally accepted accounting principles, right? Is, is sales minus expenses equal profit. And, you know, coming up, that's the way I learned. I went to the, to my accountant after the first year and I'm showing like $96,000 in profit on the bottom line. And I'm like, Hey, Mr. Accountant, I want my $96,000. I promise I'll bring it back, but I'm going to take it home. I'm going to roll on the bed in it for a little while. Then I'll put it back in a wheelbarrow and roll it around the yard and I'll bring it back. I promise. And he's like, what do you mean? He goes, if you don't have it, that's your problem. That's not my problem. And so, you know, kind of the, the thing on the accounting side of it is the accountants help prepare that statement. And then if you have a good one, like hunting them, they kind of help guide you through the rest of it. But in the end, you're accountable to actually having or realizing what's at the bottom. Uh, if not all of it, some of it. And, and I can tell you now from working this biz, working this process in my business and other businesses, I think I've got um, somewhere between 75 and 100 implementations that I've either done or advised on or or have helped completed at this point or have in process. So, you know, it's really up to you to see and realize how much money you keep in there. So instead of doing the sales minus expenses equals profit, we want to flip that around and we want to run our business from a standpoint of sales minus profit equals expenses. And and the big thing is, is we want to pay ourselves first. Um, and, and again, that goes into like the old, the old principles of money and money handling is make sure that you're taking care of, make sure that your family's taken care of first. Okay. Um, and that goes into this slide. Stop making profit a leftover. 
Uh, it's okay to pay yourself first. It's not a sin to make and keep a profit in your business. Um, my gosh, if I have if I have another shop owner argue with me over raising the labor rate five bucks when he's probably undercharging by thirty five dollars to begin with, uh, it just drives me nuts. I mean, you guys, auto shop owners as a whole are generous, kind people and would give you the shirt off their back, and I think that puts them at a disadvantage because a lot of you guys are technicians first and things like that in order to get yourself and your family and your business where you want it to be in order to do all those things. So your family's there in that business 20 years later, you have to make a profit. So if you look at our industry where we're trying to make a, a gross profit of 65 to 70% and we feel embarrassed by it or take a beating over it, and you look at like the jewelry industry, furniture, water for crying out loud. Um, when was the last time you saw a doctor that was ashamed to make a profit? I, I dare say never, probably. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you people right now, it's okay to pay yourself first. It's not a not a sin to make and keep a profit and have a successful business. Um, and I wish you all the success in the world. Okay. So one of the things is is there's a there's a law out there. It's called Parkinson's law. And the, the, the simple part of it is, is the more money we have, the more we spend. Um, he also equates it to projects. So if you have a project that takes a week, then typically you'll use the whole week to get the, the project done. If you have a project that you're given a month timeline on, typically you'll spend a whole month. Uh, I'm like the world's worst procrastinator. So if you give me a month, I'll try to find a month in a day. So the other, the same thing happens with when we're spending money, right? So if, if we have a thousand dollars cash, typically we'll spend that thousand dollars in cash. If we had $10,000 in cash, we'll spend that. And that's one of the reasons why growing fast without having the profits doesn't work because you're going to outspend yourself. Um, and it's, it's really important again, that you have the cash flow process in place and you stop the you stop the cycle of just spending everything you have and once we get this process in place we're going to throw the guardrails up and before we have just blowing out the money we're going to think about it we're going to spend more time thinking about it one of one of my recent implementations um we had this issue the the it was a million dollar a year shop never had cash was always struggling to do payroll was not paying sales tax, which mm, no, no. Um, and, you know, always behind on the bills. So we put this process in place and within two to three months, he's got sales tax paid for all the time. Um, he actually called me one day and he's like, you know what? Uh, I thought I wanted a new lift, but instead of going out and buying it, I sat and thought about it. And he goes, you know what? I really came to in the end that I didn't need another lift. And he goes, the important thing is, is in our profit account, or I'm sorry, when we set these up, we either have like a debt allocation or a equipment allocation. And he has both. Um, he goes, I actually had the cash in hand to buy the lift, but didn't spend it. So, you know, once you get into this and start cutting expenses and things in, in some ways, you're going to actually feel better not spending the money, if that makes sense. Hopefully it does. I know it's kind of. Yeah. And, and, and one of the things that we see all the time is, you know, this Parkinson's law is essentially what we call the rat race, right? You you make more money, but you never end up having more money. And, and we see it. I mean, we have shops that we work with that are doing $400,000 a year in sales. And we have shops that have multi-locations are doing, you know, over $10 million in sales. Um, and the funny thing that we like to see a lot is, you know, we have some clients that make, you know, half a million to a million dollars a year. But then I could have a shop that makes no more than 50 or 75000 And those are the shop owners that are truly wealthy right? You know, they have amassed a real estate or just cash and they have a ton of money. And it's exactly this if, is they're dedicated to, Hey, if I make a hundred thousand dollars, I'm going to set money aside. But then if you make 500 or $700,000 a year, it doesn't matter how much you make, if you're going to be spending seven or $800,000 a year. Um, and, you know, and, and this is and a lot of people don't even realize that that much money is going out. And so, you know, just getting a better understanding on the cash and, and what you should be spending or what you could be spending is huge. 
Um, and then real quick here. So Al, Al asked a good question. Hey, after this webinar, he'd like to share it with his managers. Al, um, we are recording this. So when it's done, whenever it gets uploaded online, you, you all get an email um, of this recording so you can share with whoever you would like. Yeah, absolutely. And then also, too, um, once it's over, uh, I, it has my information at the end. Um, I think also Hunt can share it. If you have any questions or whatever, obviously, if all 100 people that signed up for it asked me questions at once, I'm probably not going <laughs> to get all of them answered quickly. But um, I am teaching class this weekend and have a peer group meeting in Phoenix. So if I have time in the hotel, I'll try to answer them and do whatever do whatever I can to get back to you. Okay. That, awesome. and, and, and so that... Uh, brings me back to hunt i was teaching a class this last weekend and uh, a very successful shop owner came to me or came to the class and he was going through it he'd implemented it from from reading the book but he wanted to kind of pick my brain a little bit about what i know and everything and this guy has a quarter or two million dollar a year shop and when we're talking about allocations and everything else he's actually dropping 10 percent into his profit allocation so he's he's holding that much money out um every year and then what we do is we disperse that back to um the owner or whoever the ownership he had family members in it as well so you know it's not like we're setting it aside and we're never going to do anything with it we're just going to watch what we do with it and then spend it on our terms so um okay guys here again if you did if you don't learn anything else during this <laughs> this webinar sales tax doesn't belong to you ever 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 never it belongs to the state pass it through the business you want to throw it in another account look at your business summary every week if it says that you owe two thousand four hundred and seventy six dollars in taxes then then out of that income account that's the first thing you're going to do is take taxes out i don't ever want you guys to get in trouble with um, sales tax or the government or anything else like that um, that's a bad spot to be in and once you get into that trouble uh, I've helped several people get out of it, but it just makes it harder because then you have to first spend time talking to those people and then two, pay penalties and everything else. So just don't, uh, don't ever get yourself into that situation. Okay. The other thing is it's okay to actually show profit and pay taxes. Um, one of the allocations we're going to make is, is uh, money into the tax account. That way we can uh, have that cash sitting there to write the check so that hunting them can get it over in time and then we don't have to worry about it. So if it's, if it's sitting there, um, then it's great. Okay. Yeah. And that's, and that's one of the things is a lot of people, you know, come to us and, and everyone has this big fear of the IRS. What happens if the IRS audits me? Right. And really the IRS is the, not the audits we worry about. Um, right now, fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to look at it, the IRS is completely understaffed. So the percentage chance that you're going to get an IRS audit without doing something pretty egregious is the lowest it's ever been. Now, sales tax, on the other hand, sales tax is something that is extremely common and your peers in this industry must have been doing something wrong because it seems like shops get targeted a lot. Um, every year, we probably get six to 10 sales tax audits. And the thing that scares us about the sales tax audit is they never lose. It doesn't matter if you're doing everything by the book, they're going to find something, even if you think that you're doing everything correctly, let alone if you are doing something not correctly or not paying it whatsoever, they will come down, they'll put a chain on your door and they'll shut it down. We've seen it happen. They'll do it all the time. Um, IRS is much more reasonable. You know, I have clients that owe the IRS hundreds of thousands of dollars and have for years. As long as you're paying them back the money, they'll pretty much leave you alone the state or the city or the county with the sales tax, if they don't think that they're getting it from you, they don't care. They'll come in, they'll shut the doors tomorrow. Yeah, the, the, those people have no sense of humor at all. The federal government, they're happy taking your interest payments and everything else. Um, I had, when I had my shop, the state of Oklahoma lost one of our checks and somehow we had marked it as cleared and whatever and it skipped. They didn't cash it we filed the report and they didn't cash it. And, and, um, this little nice little lady with a gun and a badge walks through my door and says, are you the owner? I'm like, yeah. She goes, can I see your sales tax permit? I go, yeah. She goes, okay, uh, effective immediately. You're closed for non-payment of taxes. And I'm like, what are you talking about? We had the business for seven years and paid every month on time and they missed one. Um, she threw a sticker on the door. I had to drive to Oklahoma city, write a check, 
apologize and then come back and then come to find out about five or six months later, I get a phone call and they were moving offices and whoever opened the check, that's back when we actually mailed checks in, mm -hmm. um, found like a wad of checks behind somebody's desk. But anyway, uh, even though it wasn't my, our, our fault really didn't, they don't really care about that. They, they don't, just, they don't care whatever. So going back to the slide. So as sales come in, we take profit first after flowing sales tax out again, sales tax out, always sales tax out. And then we do everything else. Okay. So, so we flow the sales tax out and then we make the appropriate allocations to the appropriate accounts. Okay. So guys, I want to make a general statement here. These starting allocations are, if, if I'm like teaching this class and I don't know anything about your business, I haven't seen your income statement. I don't know what it is. This is where I would tell you to start. Um, making your allocation. So OPEX is your operating expenses. I want to start out with at least 40% of your operating expenses held aside in an account. Parts, 23%. Payroll, which when I say payroll, I include anything that goes into having that employee. The owner's payroll, the insurance for everybody, technicians, service riders, insurance, uniforms, anything miscellaneously that goes to having that employee on staff is what I would use or, or how I, how, what I equate to payroll. Okay. The, the next thing we do, we're going to do is we're going to start out about 3% in tax and that's the IRS tax. That's your end of year or end of quarter tax that you're paying on for making a profit. Um, debt, if you have debt in the business, I tell everybody, let's start at 2% and then profit at 2%. Again, people get hung up on this a lot. This is just the starting. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through all the steps, get the things we need necessarily in place. This is what we're going to start out as a minimum. And then during that first quarter, we're going to learn what accounts are over, what accounts are under. And then, you know, if you're, if your payroll with everything that I'm talking about is like 23% and you have an extra 7%, then guess what? Depending on what the hunt says, then we can either roll some of that into tax. We can do it to debt. We can do it to profit. And then by no means is this the end all be all to allocations. Um, I had a guy recently, he's like, I want to buy an airplane. I'm like, okay, let's do an allocation for that. If you want to buy an airplane, let's set money aside for that, or let's set aside the profit. And then if you want to make a sub allocation for what the profit goes to, then you can do an airplane. If you want a giraffe, whatever, whatever your wants are and needs are, as long as we can fund it, I'm fine with it. And we can set up an allocation for that. So, okay. so real quick on here. So I got one thing to add and I got a question that came in. So, um, I think most of you guys here have at least heard of Profit First. For those who have no understanding or even what we're talking about, so the general idea behind it when you see these allocations is if I have $100 come in, the old way that I do that is I put $100 into my bank account, right? And then everything is coming out of that one bank account. That's, it's, that's essentially the end of our categoriz categorization there. Right. Um, the Profit First, what we're doing is instead of having one bank account, we're having six here. And it's a visual representation to split out where that money is going to go. So like Chris was saying, these are just starting allocations, but we got 40% going to operating, 23% going to parts, et cetera. So if I have a hundred bucks come in, $23 is going into my parts account and I'm going to use that one to pay for my parts. Um, but all of this is after we've already taken our sales tax out because I got Kevin here asking a question, sales tax goes where or comes from where New York sales tax is 8%. And so Chris, right. you can correct me if I'm wrong. So if I have $108 come in, $8 off the top is going right into my sales tax account. Correct. I'm then this, left over with $100 and this is where I allocate the $100. That's exactly correct. And I'll have a slide here in a minute that kind of okay. shows that again. But, but yeah, we're, we're, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the business sales summary and say their sales tax, boom, it goes to the other thing. The other thing is you're going to have a bank account to go with each one of these. Each one of these is going to be its own bank account. Um, and we'll talk about, we'll talk more about bank accounts here in a minute. So what I'm not showing in here is the sales tax account, because that's, we just talked about that a minute ago and that's already out. So, and so Lisa, Lisa's asking if well, there'll be seven accounts and then Lisa, a little bit later in the slides, Chris actually has one that shows what, 
what total bank accounts will have for everything here. Right. You could have as many as eight or 10 accounts. Um, and I know it sounds super complicated, but I promise once you get them in, get them started, it's not. And two, if you think about this for all you Dave Ramsey fans out here, it's the exact same thing as the envelope principle. You have an envelope for OPEX, you have an envelope for parts, an envelope for payroll, and then those things are going right in there. Okay. And so you're all in um, in conjunction with those ones that we just talked about you're also you're going to have another bank account for sales tax that's your your actual physical sales tax so you can hold it aside until you are ready to make your payment to the to the 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 local tax people however that goes to and then we're also going to have a profit hold and a tax hold and i'll get into that here in, in just a minute i don't expect you to understand right now but when when i throw this slide up here in a minute it'll make more sense okay so if I should have already opened this. I'm sorry. Hang on just a second. So here's here's the allocations. If everybody can see this fine, is I just pulled up. This is a demo allocation worksheet. So so if somebody works with me or I'm helping you implement this, this is this is one of the things that I prepare for you. Now again, this may you may have more, you may have left, whatever. So the thing I want you guys to see is this down here in the yellow, that's the income minus sales tax. So on a million dollar shop for the year doing these numbers, um, and this is one of the ones that I just had in class that we kind of did. So you have a million dollars in income coming in, and then this one, their labor and payroll was about 25%, so that's what we set aside. Parts was 20%, operating expenses down to 30 um, we raised the income tax to 10% and I would like to kind of ask Hunt to fill me in on that if he thinks that's about right um, here in just a second. And then profit wise, we're putting a 15% aside or $150,000 a year. Now, I expect the owner to be pulling payroll or a, a payroll out in this amount, okay? But I also expect them to be realizing the profit account and then whatever's left over out of the income tax account. So Hunt, can you answer my question on the income tax? Like in the beginning, we set aside like 3% and then work it up from there. Mm -hmm. But what do you, like on a million dollar business that had like a 25% net mm -hmm. and was showing like a quarter of a million dollars in um, income or something like that, where do you think, how many, how many income tax dollars do you think we should hold to pay? I would say that, I mean, just like when we do our tax planning, I'd much rather take out too much and have money left over. Right. You know, and so, you know, kind of a peak performing shop, especially on a million dollar level, is going to be able to take home either in salary or profits, 25 to 30% of their sales. So if you, okay. 250 to $300,000 is a realistic okay. estimate. That right. would put us setting aside about a third of that in income tax which is gonna cover most all income taxes, even in the most expensive states like California. Um, and so I would be surprised if that wasn't enough set aside on this model. I would not be surprised whatsoever if we had excess in the income tax hold at the end of the year. Okay, and so, and so that's the thing. I'm all for have, having extra in there. And, and then again, whatever's left at the end of the year, whenever you square yourself up with the government, from what the accountant says, then whatever's left in that account, you can move it to the profit account and take the disbursement, if that makes sense to everybody. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on this while we're here? It can be confusing, but this is just a quick way. You just pop the, and, and so say we do $20,000 in a week. Um, that's what it would look like right here. Okay, so you're going, you have like 5,000 going to labor and payroll, 4,000 to parts, 6,000 to operating expenses, your income tax, and then your profit. And again, so it's going to vary by shop to shop um, and things like that. Okay. And so I guess, uh, you know, I guess I'll ask a question that some people might have is, is this shop here that you have an example of has no debt? Let's say that we had debt. How would that kind of go into the allocations? So we kind of depend on um, all things being equal, say our payroll was the same, our parts was the same, operating expenses were the same. And, and say we had, you know, we were buying a lift or whatever, then we can change this to 
say 8% and then do that to 7% and then you're, you're doing that way. But what I want you guys to see is this total down here at the bottom, this 100%. I hate the statement I gave 110%. All you have in your business is 100%. You don't have an extra 10. So whatever you do on the allocation, it has to balance out to that 100%. So if you, if you cut somewhere, then you can move it somewhere else. But if you have to cut somewhere, it has to come from somewhere in order to move it to another account. Does that make sense? It does. And, you know, and I've been asked this before of, of, hey, Hunt, you know, what we're doing here is nothing, you know, different than what we talk about a lot on the financial side of, hey, I want to make more money. All right. If we want to make more money, we either need to increase sales, which is just going to give us more dollars, or we right. need to increase our margins, which is going to proportionally give us more money for the same sales level. This is showing us the exact same thing, just another way to look at it of saying, hey, if I want my profit you know, allocation to be 15%, then I'm going to have to increase my parts margins to lower that down. Or maybe I need to reduce some of my operating expenses. So I'm getting the money there, or maybe I need to get my labor more efficient, which I'm reducing that allocation. I think what this does is it gives a good representation of, hey, there's no free lunch here. So if I want to take more money out, I need to increase or I need to improve somewhere else. And then, so if you, if you, if we talk about like the, that original model that I show up there where most shops come into, um, me at this is kind of where where we would start on a like a twenty thousand dollar week after we take the sales tax out and then again if you are under in an area so like say operating expenses say we're consistently sixty five hundred dollars a week instead of eight grand well oh i need to change that formula but anyway um you know, we're, we're actually $1,500 to the good. So then we can reduce this, this percentage amount and then put it in profit, put it in debt, put it whatever. Um, on the, on the same token, if we're in here and we're looking at 23 and $4,600 and our, you know, our, our bill every week is like six grand. Why is it high? Is it because our labor or our, our parts margin is too low? Is it because we have other issues? Are we damaging parts? Exactly what's going on there. So as you implement this, it'll also give you other ways to kind of look at it and move forward. Yeah. And, and the thing I like about this is, is people say the story numbers don't lie, which sometimes they do because sometimes they can look a bit deceptive. But what I like to say is numbers are a very good place to start. So if we're looking at this and our labor is over allocated or we have an overspend on that does that necessarily mean we have an issue with labor no but it starts to lead to questions you know if we go down through and we say well hey i think all the guys are really efficient everyone's paid pretty fairly and we still have an overspend then yeah we do have an issue now let's say that you just hired a new service advisor you went from one to two and you also have an extra technician because you're trying to grow the business we might see a temporary overspend there but it's at least getting in the back of our head that we are looking to see something specific. Right. Um, now, Chris, I had someone here, Mark asked um, if we can get this spreadsheet with the formulas. Are you, can you share this? Can we share the spreadsheet out after the webinar? Um, yeah, I can share it. If again, how many people do we have? We've got like 17 to 25 people looks like on it. If, uh, so we have about 75 actually. Oh, cause my thing says 17. So yeah, okay. I think it's people just asking questions. Yeah. So if, if somebody wants one of these worksheets, I will go, I use, I use Google docs for everything. So if they some, can just email you and you can share that with them, just email me with the shop name and I will make a copy and send you the link back. And so when I, you know, kind of how I hold my clients accountable, is I'll do the link and send it back. And then you're going to have to ask me permission to edit it. So if you ask me for it, I'll know if you don't ever use it one and two, I'm more than happy giving you access to it. So just email me when we're done. And like I said, when I'm sitting in the hotel this weekend, I'll go through and grant everybody access to it. Right, um, perfect. One more quick thing is, um, on the labor and payroll, like, so say a lot of shop owners come to me and they've got, a technician in the back or they just hired some technicians and now they're writing servers full time. One of the, one of the things that I use this tool for is say, say we want to hire a service writer so we can move the owner out of that position. If we're using this model and we're doing a good job at everything else, 
we should start having some extra money show up in here and then we can kind of figure out a can we afford to hire a service rider or or b we're flat broke with the way it is what do i need to do in order to hire the service rider and so those are some of the things that when i look teach and coach off of this that's that's kind of what i do yeah and that's a good a good thing to bring up because you know the end goal for anyone's shop should be we are going to you know, build this business to sell, right? And so we don't want the owner being the service advisor for two things. Hey, someone doesn't want to buy a business where the service advisor is going to leave the next day. And then two, you know, you should be owning the business, working on your business, not in your business. And so just like Chris was saying, hey, maybe your allocation right now for labor is 20%, but we know at some point you're going to have to hire a service advisor. So we're going to have that allocation set at 26%. So we're building this business to be designed to have a service advisor and be able to afford it um and then heather here um yeah at the end of this we i'll share chris's email so that you have it so that you can um, request to get the spreadsheet share with you not a problem yeah. and i think it's on the last slide too if perfect I remember. so so when i say research banks i don't mean go out and and nitpick them to figure out which one's going to give you the best interest or anything else the the big thing with the bank I want to know is I want to negotiate so I don't have any zero balance fees. And then one of these accounts, we're going to let go to zero and, and do some things with it on the expenses side of it. So um, actually that would be a current bank. So like whoever you're with currently, you want to talk to them and be like, I want, I want this bank account to go to zero. And if a bill comes in, that's over that amount, I want it to get kicked out. I don't want any draft protection or anything else like that. So the big thing when we, research a bank is we want to make sure that there's zero fees and pretty much any bank you talk to if you go in and you're like hey i want to do this i want to implement it in my business um i need accounts with a zero balance or or no penalties for zero balance most of them will be like oh we can't do that and then the minute you stand up to walk out they'll be like oh wait a minute we didn't you know we, okay 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 we love you we, we don't want you to go anywhere else and if your current bank is capable of doing this then i'm all for saying you know where you're at one thing um because i'm mobile and i travel full time all the banks that i use in mine i can make my allocations and everything for my cell phone um online so i would tell you it'll ease your ease your pain and everything else if you do this through a bank that you can do it online with okay yeah i mean we like to work with local smaller people because at the end of the day small business financing has become more and more difficult you know the big banks td wells fargo if you try and go get a loan or something they're just not going to work with you they don't know who right. you are you're not spending enough money for them to really care and so we like looking at those smaller regional banks now in, in practice, it's harder and harder to find because they're getting bought up. And then just like Chris said, at some point we can't go too small where they don't have online banking and transfers and stuff like that. Cause then it's just, we're not working with someone that's in the 21st century. Right. Yeah. I would say, and I'm going to get on my soapbox here just a minute. I would equate that to a shop, not having a digital inspection program. Mm -hmm. If you're do, doing digital inspections, you should, if your bank doesn't have online banking, they should. Yeah. Um, so the other thing is, is we are either going to set up, we're either going to set all this up in two separate banks. Um, I will say I'm okay doing everything at one bank. If you have kind of like a, a an inter squad two bank system set up. And by that, I mean, we're going to have the bulk of our accounts under one login and password, but in order to get to our sales tax and our profit hold and tax hold accounts, you're going to have to log in um into a completely different one i don't want you to be able to open it up and see everything at once i want you to have to uh, i want you to have this out of sight out of mind uh, mentality with part of this so the so the other things is you just open your accounts this screen's kind of small but um when you look at it you're going to and then so when i set this up i didn't set it up with the full like seven eight ten but um we're gonna have like the income account profit account, tax hold, owner's comp, and then operating expense. The reason why I put this, um, this, uh, this slide in here is if you will look right here where it says profit five, whenever you name these accounts, I want you to go in and name the account profit and we're holding 5% out. And then you can change those at any time. So, you know, profit five, owner's comp five, tax hold 4%, um, but I want you to notice up here, if you look at what I have up here, it's operating expenses minus 10. Uh, 
So that's my reminder every time I go into that bank account that I'm trying to cut my operating expenses by 10%, 10%, 10%, okay? So once you get the bank accounts open, then you start, you start making allocations. You are like full on, out the door, here we go, making allocations. Um, and so to go back to what I was talking about a minute ago, we're going to start making allocations, but we're also going to start cutting expenses because we want to get, we want to run as lean a business as we can. So in your current operating account, where I'm assuming most everybody has everything coming in, everything going out, I want you to stop using that account altogether. What I want you to do is if you have, say, $15,000 in that account, I want you to have all these other accounts open and ready. And then on a Friday or whatever, I, I want you to allocate all that money in that account over. Okay. And then once that account's zero, I want to make sure that your bank knows that you have zero money in there. And if somebody tries to do an auto draft or auto debit, I don't want them to approve it. I want them to kick it out. And the reason why I want them to kick it out is I want somebody from the uniform place. I want somebody from uh, waste oil management. I want somebody from whoever you do business with that's automatically sucking money out of your account. I want them to physically have to call you and ask your permission for the next bank account. That way you can make the determination of, yes, this is a vendor I want to keep or no, it's a vendor I don't want to keep and I'm not giving them access to my account. Because I don't know how many of you guys out there have like 10, 15, 20 people just randomly drawing money out of your account, but um, I, I would love to put a stop to that as much as we can, okay? Now, question, I got a, Tracy asked, what about service fees? Um, Tracy, if you could clarify um, if you could clarify on the chat of what you're talking about for what service fees, um, I would appreciate it because I'm not sure. I'm, I wonder if you're saying what service fees uh, as, as in, hey, if some of these get kicked back or some of these bounce, are you talking about a service fee on that aspect or actual banking service fees? So I'll let Chris keep on going. If you could just clarify that in chat, we'll, we'll hop back into that. Okay. I, th I think probably what she means is, you know, that's why I want to tell the bank, say, hey, bank, we're going to zero and then we should have it negotiated. So we're not getting penalized for, for having zero in the account and, and everything like that. But I'll let her clarify. I know if it's, if something usually bounces, I mean, this day and age where everything is linked to a credit card, you almost never get a service fee for a true um, bounce because everyone has stuff changing all the time. Right. Um, and, oh, and, she, and, and she's asking about having monthly service fees for the banking. And so I yeah. think, Chris, you were saying, you know, that's one of those things where if you go back to them, it's one of the first things that you can get negotiated out, right? Yeah. When you're, when you're talking to the bank, trying to set this up, that's one of the things you want to negotiate. You want to, you want to have like a no minimum. So there's no service fee for a minimum. And then on that one account that we're talking about, we want to make sure that um, as that account goes to zero or hit zero, um, typically what happens is, is when you go to a bank, they ask you if you want the overdraft protection. And then if you say yes, then they'll overdraft your account, but that's when they charge you the 35 bucks overdraft fee or whatever. So if you tell a bank, I don't want to overdraft a penny ever, then they just will kick everything out and then they're not going to charge you for it because it's, it gets kicked out. So. And now have you ever came across banks that said we there's the service fees are what they are. We're not going to get rid of them or most of them. Once you start questioning, we'll get rid of them. Um, most of them will, so, you know, I'll run across um, every, you know, one every once in a while that says no, but guess what? You go across the street, somebody out there wants your business. Yeah. And uh, I guess that's, I mean, that's a complete commodity. If you're going to hold my money and you're going to pay it out and you got an online, a good online banking interface then Hey, you know what? I'm willing to work with someone that's going to value my business for all the money that I come through, not the 20, $30 fees here and there. Right. And so, you know, that's the other thing is you need to tell them that you're trying to run a fiscally responsible, progressive business that's going to have positive cash flow, pay all of its bills on time. And then if we need to borrow money, we're going to have a record of all that. And, you know, we're ready to go. And, and you know, uh, you know, a lot of people's opinions of repair shops are not the greatest in the world. And honestly, they come by that because they've probably been burned several times. So, you know, gotcha. you, have to, you have to go in and tell them, say, this is, this is what I'm doing. This is what I want to do. And, you know, I personally have probably talked to about 20 to 25 banks on my customer's behalf to explain, you know, exactly what we're doing. 
Um, yeah, and, and Lisa, I think that because she followed up, she said, um, our local bank will not negotiate service fees. They're local. They like them, but they re do require minimum balances. Lisa, if they're a small local bank, then I think that you'd be able to go in and have a conversation with them and say, hey, I realize I'm going to have two bank accounts here with a zero balance, but don't look at those two bank accounts. Look at all the money that I'm banking with you with. Right. Here's because why I'm trying to do it, and, and here's what's going on. You're still going to have the money. It's going to be a couple of different accounts. Um, and then at that point, I think it would just be a cost benefit analysis. If they're going to charge you 30 or 40 bucks a month, but you like doing business with them and you enjoy it, then, then, Hey, you know what? Maybe you pay for it. If not, then, you know, then go away and, and go right. find something else. Exactly. Yeah. Um, most people when pressed, they'll get rid of it and they can, they can do that. Banks can do whatever they want, but also look at, you know, a bank's lending power and everything depends on the amount of money that they've got in the account. So they get, you know, they can lend money based on your average daily balance and everything else as it pertains to them. So if they see you move a lot of cash through there, they should still be okay with it. So the last slide where I was talking about getting it out. So pay only what is necessary and everything else goes away. And this is kind of where the commingling thing goes in there. Stop paying Netflix for your house, you know, pay yourself a salary and pay it out of that pay, you know, what's required to run the business. That's what you should keep. And then everything else could go. Cause these are just, these people are just bleeding you um, and, and your business dry. Okay. So, so a couple of questions here. So Chris, you can chime in if this is wrong, but uh, Melinda asked me, what do you think about credit unions? I mean, credit unions are just usually a smaller local bank. So credit unions bank 100% good. And a lot of times the local credit unions understand you and your business more. So perfect. Right. I'm, I'm fine with local credit unions. My, my issue was the last credit union I dealt with their online banking was terrible. Yeah. And that's, I mean, and that's the thing is if you go too small, like you say, if, if you're sacrificing the online banking, then it's not worth it. Um, and I don't care. I don't care what bank it is. Um, as long as they meet the requirements and they're, they're willing to work with you. Uh, honestly, I use um, Capital One and I use um, Wells Fargo, but I had a really good local branch of Wells Fargo. And when I set my business up and when I already had my business with them, but when I went to Profit First, I went in and sat down with the guy in the office and was like, I'm not going to pay these fees. And if you don't like it, I'll go somewhere else. And he's like, hey, okay, you know, you've been with us for like, X amount of years, we want to keep you. And we're fine with that. So they go in and they hit the little toggle in their computer program. And then it just doesn't, it doesn't charge you for it. Perfect. So. And then two quick questions before we get into, I know we're kind of coming up here on time, but um, Kevin was asking, um, what about having a clearance account or where all deposits go through before disbursement? That way, if we have checks or credit cards that balance, you're not transferring it. So when all the money comes in, do we have one account that goes into as the main account or how does that work? Yeah, it all comes into your income account. Okay, perfect. And so then we get transferred out of that income account. And then you're going to transfer it out of the income account. So if you want to have one, if you have one account where your cash deposits, check deposits, and all your credit cards go into, then I'm perfectly fine with that. And now what about bad checks and credit card holds and stuff like that? Do you recommend waiting a couple of days before doing that daily transfer or, or how does that come about? <sighs> I, so I don't do it. I don't do it daily and I don't coach it daily. I tell everybody to let that money sit for a week. So like, um, Monday through Friday, you do your business on the following Monday, you should have had all your credit card transactions from the previous week hit, make your allocations first thing Monday morning. Perfect. If you want, if you want to do it every day, then fine. But, but you, you could, you could run that risk of having a, a chargeback or something like that. Yeah, you could, but that's a, that's a whole nother problem. If you have like credit card chargebacks and bad checks, I would say one, stop taking checks and two, <laughs> who are you pissing off that, um, they're disputing this or something. For. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I would say that that would be indicative of a couple of other issues that we would have to look at. And then, so last thing, so um, you go down to zero on all these accounts. And I think a lot of that is kind of a visual representation that we're using all of it. Jimmy had a good question here. What about if we just leave a hundred dollars in some of these accounts so that we get a, a, we get around those minimum balance if they do have a minimum balance? What do you think on that? Um, yeah, I'm fine with that. Whatever you want. If it's a bank you love and you want to keep it, then fine. Um, yeah. I've had, I've had some people, you know, hide $500 in there because, um, they love this bank and then the bank may, made them have a $500 minimum deposit for all these accounts. And I about mm -hmm. blew a sprocket. Um, I'm like, I personally wouldn't do it, but if that's what you want to do and we have the cash available for it, 
you know, put it in there, out of sight, out of mind, lose it, and then just move forward. So I'm, yeah, and I'm Jimmy, if, if, if it's $100 for all the accounts, you know, we essentially could fund every single one for 800 bucks, and then that's just our new, our new zero. Right. So I'll, I'll let you... I'll let you go from here, Chris. Yeah, because I want to, I mean, I don't have a problem staying longer, but I just want to make sure that everybody yep. get everything care of. So, so here's like the big flow chart board of, of how this should work. So, so you make your, you take care of the customer, you make the invoice, the deposit goes into that income account that we were talking about. And actually I need to make a note. I should label that. So it says income account. So it's a little bit easier to understand. Um, so it goes into your deposit or your income account. And guess what? We're taking care of the sales tax first. So you're going to your, your business summary and taking the sales tax out and it's going into your sales tax account. So there's a, you have an actual account that's for sales tax and that's where that goes, okay? So the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna start making your allocations. So you're gonna take that um, allocation chart that I give you whenever you request it and you're gonna put whatever your deposit is minus sales taxes and then you're gonna make all your allocations, okay? So this is kind of the weekly, this is like the weekly thing to do. And whenever you're making these allocations, once you get, after about two, three months, once you get through that first quarter, this should take like five minutes. If you're, if you're doing it online and everything, you should be able to hammer that out in like five minutes or so. Okay. Um, the other thing we haven't really talked about yet is down here. I want to try to set you guys up. And this is something when you're talking to vendors and setting everything up with them, um, tell them that you have a new uh, cash flow process or whatever process you want to call it. And you're only paying bills on the 10th and the 25th. So you're going to go through and look at, you know, on the 10th, you're going to pay, pay what you, what you've got. And then on the 25th, you're going to pay what you've got. I don't really care about the dates. If you want to do it on the 8th and the 27th or whatever, whatever works for you, that's fine. Also, if you want to do your payroll, those two days you can, or if you want to stagger your payroll and do your payroll in the off weeks, then I'm fine with that. But I want you to have, instead of all this cash coming in and then all the cash coming out, I want the cash to come in, it level off like a plateau or Mesa, and then we just have like money going out on our terms. Instead of just paying it weekly or whatever, I want it to go out when we want it to go out, however we set that up, okay? And then, um, and then I got real, real quick here. So uh, Sandra asked about COD with special parts. So if it's COD, um, we're going to control as much as we can, but stuff like that, you're just going to have to pay when that comes in. You're, you're writing a check out of the parts account. Yeah. So, so that's a, that's another thing is you're going to have a, probably the payroll is going to be a checking account. The parts going to be a checking account. Um, a lot of people ask, what do you think about credit cards that give you points back and everything? I'm fine for you doing that. As long as you pay the balance off 100% every month. I don't want you to use the credit card like a bank, but if you're, if you're truly going to set that money aside and you're going to pay that parts bill off every month, then fine. Um, your profit account, debt account, tax accounts, all those can be savings accounts, all those three. Um, and if you can pay, if you're to the point to where you pay pretty much all your bills online, then there's no reason to have checks floating around there. Um, so you're going to give, you know, if you have an outside payroll company, the only, the only account they're going to have access to is this payroll account. You're not going to give them access to pull any funds out of anything else. Okay. Now, a question that came in. And, and so um, Jimmy asked, we got a credit card payment. They're allocated in QuickBooks, but it comes in as a lump sum. I'm guessing because if he's using his credit card for parts and operating expenses, how would you kind of go about paying that? Would you try to just do he a rough a guess or what? He needs to separate that out. I would, I would separate the accounts out and have one card for one and one card for the other. That gotcha. way it's easy to track. I would, that way you don't have to mess with it. You just know the Amex yeah. is for parts, the Chase is for operating expenses and we yep. operate it as such. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And then, so the other thing is, is if you, if we're truly on a cash basis, I mean, well, no, that goes back to the other statement. You, you know, you can have a debit card for op operating expenses if you want to, but I would even question that if, you know, if you, if you, but if you're going to have, if you have more than, if you have any commingling of any of these funds, you need to separate up separately. So you have a different, um, or you're paying like, just like he said, if you're going to pay American Express with operating, uh, or you're going to pay the American Express out of the operating account, do that. And then the parts the other. So, 
And then um, one more one more question here. So Randy's asking, uh, payroll taxes, is payroll taxes all going to come out of the payroll? Yes, everything regarding payroll comes out of the payroll. So that's so, it. We, and we look at the payroll just like we look a lot on the financials of loaded costs. So that's going to be correct. Payroll, payroll tax, whether that's the employer or employee portion, that's yep. going to be also your workers' comp, your uniforms, and stuff like that. So anything yep. remotely related to payroll, Randy, is going to be coming out of that payroll account. Correct. And so, you know, if you, like I just had um, one of my profit first clients, he just asked me, you know, we're having a Christmas party this month and I have extra money in some of these accounts. Where should it come out of? And I asked him, he's like, well, I think that should come out of operating expenses. And I'm like, it's a Christmas party for the employees. So in my mind, that would come out of payroll. And a lot so, of this stuff is is not black and white either, right? You know, it, yeah, as long as you have yeah. a good idea behind it and it works for yeah. you, you know, we're we're starting here with a basic premise. There's going to be weird stuff. We're going to fall into a couple of different things. And there's a lot of times no wrong answer in, you know, as long as you can explain it in your own sense. Right. And so, yeah, and you know, I, this is, don't, don't get so static or hardcore that you, that you're paralyzed by doing something because you don't know if it fits in the rules. I mean, remember, this is your cash flow management system. We're putting it in place for you. This is just like the basis of the groundwork. So, so I want you to look at these lines for just a minute, everybody. So we've got tax and profit. So at the end of the quarter, we have what we call these allocation hold accounts right here, okay? So at the end of the quarter, you're going to take half the profit as a disbursement, if, if that's what you wanna do, and then you're gonna put the other half of the profit in the profit hold, okay? So just because you have all this money stuck in profit doesn't mean you're never gonna to get to take it out of there. You're just gonna wait till the end of the quarter to take it, okay? And then after you, for this money that's left over in the profit hold, um, you're, you're going to keep that until the end of the year. Once your taxes and everything are paid, you're going to take like a, a lump sum disbursement out of that account, wherever it is. And so likewise, you're going to put your money into this tax hold account at the end of every quarter. And depending on what you're doing with the bank, you, or I'm sorry, with the accountant, you're either going to leave all that money in there until the end of the year, or if you pay your taxes quarterly, you're going to go ahead and do your quarterly tax disbursement or your quarterly tax payment um, out of that account. Hopefully that makes sense. And then as we keep flowing to the right, after the accountant's done and happy, then we you know, pay the final taxes, write ourselves whatever's left out of there, um, you get to keep. And then the final profit, you get to keep. Okay. Do you, do you have any questions about that hunt? I kind of, I mean, it looks way more complicated than it is, but I think usually when people see this, they're better with it. Yeah. And so I, I guess I'll answer a question here and, and I think I got the hang of this. So Eileen asked, is the quarterly an additional two accounts? So no, well, the tax hold and the profit hold, those are two separate accounts. Those correct? are two other accounts. Yeah. And so the idea behind those ones is, and it's different because those are in a completely separate bank account, correct? Right. They're, similar, in, they're, they're either in a complete different bank or this is where I, you know, talked about the two logins and everything set up. And so the reason we want to see this tax hold and profit hold is those are truly out of sight, out of mind. We're not touching those until the end of the year to make right. sure that we don't need that money for tax. Right. Um, and then so as far as uh, the quarterly payments going, and so what's going to happen on that is we have the tax, the 3%. And so at the end of the quarter, what we're going to do is we're either going to use all that money to pay our quarterly tax disbursement or quarterly taxes, Correct. or we're going to put into tax hold. But realistically, for a lot of people, it's going to be a mixture of both. Hey, right. at the end of the quarter, we allocated 3%, which turned out to be about $20,000. I have quarterly taxes in the total of $16,000. $16,000 is going to go out to the IRS or the state. And then I have $4,000 that is then going to transfer into that tax hold. Um, the idea behind that tax hold is at the end of the year, if we have more tax or we have more income than we thought, that hold is there as kind of a safety net. If we end up not needing that money, then that comes out to us in a form of profit. Correct. That's exactly the way you want to do it. The big thing is, is we want this money set aside. Um, you know, earlier I talked about the $26,000 tax bill. Um, luckily slash unluckily for me, 
um, I had a 401k that had about $30,000 in it. I cashed it out early and then paid the IRS and then learned my lesson on that. So <laughs> I, you know, I want to make, I want to make sure that you guys understand that this is for the owner's benefit. And by owner's benefit, I mean, it's there so that the business can pay your taxes for you and then you can keep whatever's left. And guys, I promise you, if you hang on with me, I think we're on slide 23 and I think I have like two, three more to go. So I'll, we'll be done here. Really go quick. for it. So here's the bank set up. You're going to have bank one with your tax, debt, profit, operating expense, parts, and payroll. And I forgot to put income. I need to add income to that. Um, so you're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then again, if you don't need a debt one, then you're not going to have it. But if you have an airplane account or a giraffe account, this is where you're going to put that in. So it's going to be income plus these. And then in that second bank, you got the sales tax because the sales tax doesn't belong to us. It's out of sight, out of mind. And then you have right. these two hold accounts. Okay. All right, guys. So, I mean, uh, that's not too bad for something that normally takes me eight hours to cut it down to like an hour and five minutes. So um, this is actually an old, old slide that I have in there asking the world pack classes, you know, would you like an accountability <laughs> group? Would you guys like a peer group or a Facebook group to kind of help you through the um, process? Um, the implementation process should take less than a, than a month. So like if you, if you told me, Chris, I'm going to have this, I'm going to implement it. And today's the 12th, then I would expect you to have the bank accounts open and making allocations no later than January 12th. And, and honestly, it's probably a two week process to get started as long as you don't procrastinate and, and um, do it. I also want you to write down when you're going to start it and when you're going to finish implementing it. Okay, guys. Um, Oh, I don't have the slide on here. Um, so if you guys want to get a hold of me, get ready. I'll give you my, my phone number and my email address. Go for it. I'll type it out in here. Right. Okay. So, oh, I guess that's true. I can get out of this screen now and, and go back to the screen. So my, my phone number, it's my cell phone. It's right here. I don't ever go anywhere without it. It's 580 491 three five one nine and my email address is chris at autofixsos.com so it's C H R I S at A U T O F I X S O S dot com. Um, like I said, normally that's like an eight hour presentation and I do go into some more stuff on profit and areas where we're not making profit. Um, I teach classes for world pack. Uh, we're going to have one coming up in Seattle, the middle of January. It's not on their training board yet. Um, but we're going to try to do one like once a month all across America. So again, if you have questions, feel free to to ask me uh, if you're part of world pack or whatever look for those classes on their website and see if you want to come out hang out for the whole day half a day whatever you want to do um and then we'll go from there you got any more questions or anything else Hunt? yeah i really want to just say that you know first of all thank you this has been extremely helpful um but um you know i think one of the things is 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 this gets people interested in their finances right and so there's no wrong way to do this because we're not spending this money right if even if we split into 10 accounts we still have the same amount of money it's just split throughout our you know the different bank accounts here and so a lot of people i think are get so nervous about doing this that they just don't even implement anything and so right. really the first step is don't you agree is to just get set up start getting our percentages implemented here and don't think of it as a hard number you know it's it's just all of a sudden, hey, we don't have any money in the parts account. If we're doing this the first month, don't go crazy and say, well, I'm not writing any parts vendor bills. It's saying, no, we're going to work with this and we're going to see what this should be at for my specific business. Well, and again, if you look back to what I said about most um, repair shops or most businesses, most of them struggle with cash. So in the beginning, it's probably going to be painful. You're going to be like, oh, I don't have the money in that account. And I would tell you kind of let it ride, write things out. And if you have to put somebody off, put somebody off until you, you know, like a week or two in when you've got some money in those accounts and then flow it out again too. 
um, you know, I don't know how often vendors come to us and then like, oh, we we go through uh, accounts payable where we just switched it from 30 days to 60 days. Mm -hmm. and they expect you to just suck it up and deal with it. So guess what? If you tell your vendor, sorry, um, today's the 11th and we just started a program where we're not paying our bills until the 10th, then they need to wait a month to get paid and then they're going to have to deal with it. They need to figure out if they want to um, really be a part of your business or not. So you need to make these people you know, bend to you and your rules because you are their customer, not the other way around. A lot of times I find vendors in the repair business that they, they treat us like, like um, they're our customer instead of the other way around. Uh, the other thing is when I first bought my shop, did a million three a year and I thought, oh, you know, I have a little bit of profit at the bottom. I'm going to sell my way out of it because I'm a natural salesperson. So I went from a million three to two million dollars that first year. And um, when I hired the coaching company to help me out, when I looked at everything and looked at it, I was like, minus 3% profit. But when you have a $2 million a year business, you have cash to flow it through the business all the mm -hmm. time pretty much. So it's not an issue until you really look at it. So those first slides in the beginning where I'm talking about, um, you know, don't grow until you have the stuff fixed, fix this then grow. 100% agree. Chris, we lose you here. I think Chris's internet's going in and out. Oh, there you are. I lost you, Hunt. I don't know what happened. I'm not sure if it's me or you. Okay. No, we're, we're all here now. So I don't know how much of that you guys thought. I was probably rambling just a little bit. So I think <laughs> we're all right. Cool. Well, so, I think that's all I got. What else? I mean, well, I guess to wrap up real quick. So everyone that's on here, um, you'll get an email from me that will have the recording of this. Feel free to share it with anyone in-house, um, any other shop owners that you think could find this useful. Um, I'll also send out Chris's uh, direct contact information on that follow-up email as well. Um, should be able to get that out to you a little bit later today or whatever it's available for me to send the recording for you. All right. I just want to uh, thank everybody for their time. Looks like most people held on this extra 15 minutes. So that's great. Thank you for spending the extra 15 minutes. I know you're all busy. Um, if you ever need anything, uh, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, Hunt's got my information plus I just gave it or you can go to uh, autofixsos.com and, and get to my website. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again for joining us. Thanks again, Chris. And uh, I'm going to sign off here. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day and a great weekend. Thank you.